Welcome to this module introducing distributional cost effectiveness analysis. So in this module, you will learn about the equity concepts underlying distributional cost effectiveness analysis, how distributional cost effectiveness analysis differs from conventional cost effectiveness analysis, and the main components of conducting a distributional cost effectiveness analysis. So as you probably know, Conventional cost effectiveness analysis, or CEA, evaluates efficiency by comparing the aggregate costs and benefits of alternative strategies to improve total population health. So the goal here is to assess the overall value for money. But this approach does not provide full information to support decision making that would eventually take into account how costs and benefits might vary for different populations. In other words, about who gains and who loses from a given new intervention. And policymakers might not just want to make decisions based on overall costs and benefits. They might also want to consider which populations benefit the most or the least, while, of course, still taking into account efficiency. So distributional cost effectiveness analysis, or DCEA, which extends the scope of CEA, can actually help to support this specific type of decision making. Essentially, it adds to traditional CEA information about equity by specifically including distributions of costs and benefits according to different population subgroups. And eventually, DCEA identifies and quantifies the, population, the potential trade-offs that can occur between achieving efficiency in the sense of improving total population health and achieving equity by reducing unfair health inequality. Then, as I mentioned, in the case of DCA, we need to define the population subgroups that will be the focus of concern about equity. So here on this slide are just some examples of such equity relevant population characteristics like socioeconomic status, geographical location, ethnicity, gender, age. Or it could also be uh, some specific health states like disability or maybe based on other criteria like uh, the rarity of disease, proximity to death or orphan condition. And of course, these are just some examples and we can potentially examine other relevant subgroups depending on the research question, the decision making context and the data availability, of course. Then there are several interesting reasons why DCA is of interest to health services researchers who use simulation models and to health economists as well. So first, DCA goes beyond just the subgroup analysis because equity is a general population concept, meaning that ideally it should consider outcomes for the general population and not just for the program recipients. So in this way, looking at outcomes in the general population is important because it causes us to consider costs and benefits for non-recipients because a new intervention might potentially have an impact on their health and well-being as well, and not only on the recipients from the program. And this impact on the non-recipients may actually be described in the form of opp opportunity costs, which occur when resources are displaced from alternative, alternative investments that would otherwise have generated health benefits for the recipients and non-recipients of the program. Secondly, DCA also addresses interesting ethical issues and concepts. So it is a rich method for investigating social value judgments about equity and efficiency, about how these objectives conflict, and about how trade-offs between equity and efficiency can be resolved in ways that do actually not necessarily fully maximize either objective. And finally, many technical challenges remain to explicitly modeling real-world complexities, especially with imperfect data, in order to produce accurate and credible simulations of distributional consequences. And because DCA is still quite a recent approach, the methods will require ongoing development and improvement in the years to come. So DCA also definitely provides an interesting and challenging opportunity for researchers who want to work on equity issues in the framework of cost effectiveness analysis. And this either in improving methods or in some more practical applications. 
then, and that is very important, then when talking about equity, it is important to acknowledge that there are different ways to think about equity, which can mean different things to different people, including decision makers. So it's really important to identify which way of thinking is relevant when we conduct a DCA. And to illustrate this, four main ways of thinking about equity are presented on this slide. So you have the fair shares, the value maximizing, the moral rights, and the fair processes. So first, on the top left, we have the fair shares, fair shares, fair shares way of thinking, which considers that all individuals and groups should receive a fair share of resources in proportion to the strength of their claim. For example, the distribution of healthcare in proportion to the need. Then on the top right is the moral rights way of thinking about equity. It is about normative rules regarding what duties individuals owe to each other and what actions are perceived as just or as unjust. For example, a doctor may owe patients a duty of care or we might consider that patients have a right to autonomy, a right to be treated with dignity, a right to non-discrimination, etc. And below, there is the fair processes way of thinking. So this one is slightly different because unlike fair shares, moral rights, and value maximizing, that I will explain in the next slide, which are three of them about ethical principles, the fair processes way of thinking is about following fair procedure for choosing. For example, a process that is impartial, transparent, and accountable. And finally, at the top center, you have the value maximizing way of thinking, which encompasses most of the economics literature on equity, and thus on DCA. So the idea here is to compare strategies by ranking them according to how well their, their consequences succeed in fulfilling one or more objectives. And most of the time, these objectives can include one, to maximize total health benefits subject to a cost constraint, in other words, efficiency, and second, to minimize unfair health inequality, which is, in other words, equity. And since these objectives might not be simultaneously fulfilled, DCEA provides a way to quantify the trade-offs between efficiency and equity, and a way to rank the strategies in order to maximize overall value or social welfare, that is, taking into account both efficiency and equity objectives. And it's also important to bear in mind that DCA does not commit the analyst to any particular set of social value judgments, which is definitely the role of decision makers. But one essential step of DCA is actually to consider which of the ways of thinking about equity is most relevant to decision makers, so that we can actually quantify it in the analysis which is why it is extremely important to ensure that decision makers are closely involved in these value judgments when we conduct a DCA. So then just before going into more details on DCA, it is useful to review the key measures and outcomes of traditional cost effectiveness analysis. So assessing the cost effectiveness of a new intervention entails estimating the incremental or additional cost and health effect of one intervention or one strategy compared to one or more alternatives, one of which, of course, is generally the current or the reference situation. And based on that assessment, as you probably know, the analytical tool of CEA is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or ICER, which is defined as the difference in cost divided by the difference in health benefits between the two alternatives. And health benefits are often represented in the form of quality, just like peers of quality. So the ICER in this case represents the cost per quality gained associated with one intervention compared to another one. As you can see on this slide with an example comparing just a new strategy named A to an alternative, to an alternative named B. But of course, report, just reporting ICERs is not sufficient. It is Important to know that in order to determine whether an intervention is likely to be cost effective, it must be compared to a benchmark value. And that's the point of the cost effectiveness threshold, which provides a simple and transparent decision rule, which is that an, interven an intervention is deemed cost effective compared to another one, of course. 
if its ICER is below the cost effectiveness threshold and not cost effective if this is higher than that threshold value. And one approach to thinking about a cost effectiveness threshold and to define it is that it describes whether or not the amount of health that an intervention generates is greater than the health that could have been generated if the money required to fund, fund that intervention had been spent on something else. So in that sense, the cost effectiveness threshold represents what the economists refer to as the opportunity cost. So this slide represents the standard cost effectiveness plane that you may be fam familiar with. It is a simple and a convenient way to visually represent the cost effectiveness framework. So the origin is a baseline situation without any intervention. The vertical axis represents the incremental change in costs, and the horizontal axis represents the change in the health outcome. So if the, co if the consequences of a new intervention are estimated to be reduced cost and increased health, then it is a dominant strategy or a win-win situation, as you can see in the southeast quadrant here in green. On the contrary, if the consequences are estimated to be increased cost and reduced health, then it is a lose-lose northwest quadrant that you can see in red, and it is what we call a dominated strategy. And if the consequences are estimated to be either increased cost with increased health, which is a lose-win situation in the northeast quadrant, and that's actually the, the situation that we typically encounter, or if it is reduced cost with reduced health, which is a win-lose situation in the southwest quadrant, a case that we actually encounter much less often. So in these two cases, calculating the ICERs and comparing them to a threshold value is necessary to determine whether the intervention is cost effective, because in these both cases, we can't say that it's really dominant or dominated without applying ICERs and assessing the cost effectiveness. So you can so as you can see here by using this framework, we can say whether a strategy is cost effective or not, meaning that we provide information about efficiency. But, but we cannot actually say anything about equity on this specific framework. So now when analyzing efficiency and equity trade-offs in DCA, especially if we want to represent it in a similar plane with two axes, we ideally want an aggregate measure of efficiency impact, which can then be compared with an aggregate measure of equity impact. So for this reason, it is often useful to use the net benefit approach to represent the efficiency impact. Because the concept of net benefit combines or collapses health effects and costs into a single summary measure, either the net monetary benefit, which is NMB, or the net health benefit, NHB. So first, the net monetary benefit expresses efficiency in monetary terms. So for the incremental net monetary benefit, more precisely, the incremental health benefits are transformed into their monetary value equivalents using the cost effectiveness threshold. It is just actually multiplied by the cost effectiveness threshold to do that. And in this case, a new strategy is cost effective if its incremental net monetary benefit is positive, which means that the incremental cost of the intervention is less than the cost to provide the equivalent health benefit elsewhere. Then, kind of on the contrary, the net health benefit expresses efficiency in units of health effects, such as quality, for example. So for the incremental net health benefit, the incremental costs are transformed into the quality of other health equivalents. And here too, by applying the cost effectiveness threshold, we just need to divide uh, the incremental cost by that threshold. And the same thing happens, like a new strategy is cost effective if its incremental net health benefit is positive. So here, like just bear in mind that using either like the net monetary benefit or the net health benefit, doesn't change anything about the results in terms of what strategy of what strategy is cost effective for a given threshold value. It actually it actually just changes what units are used to measure the results. Okay, so now that we have an aggregate measure of efficiency impact, 
that combines both cost and health effects using the net benefit that I just presented in the previous slide. We actually want and need an aggregate measure to describe equity impact and compare it to that aggregate measure of efficiency impact. So there are actually a lot of inequality measures that can be used for that. And here on this slide are just some examples of just such inequality measures com commonly used. It is not an extensive list, but it can give some sense of the possibilities and available measures. So basically the mergers, the, the inequality measures that can be either so simple or complex, depending on whether they compare the situation in just two population subgroups or more than two population subgroups. They can be ordered or non-ordered, depending on whether the popula these population subgroups have a natural ordering, ordering or not. They can focus on absolute differences between population subgroups or differences in proportions, which is why we refer to um, absolute measures or real, real, relative measures. And they can be weighed population subgroups according to their population size, or they can be unweighted, meaning that we actually weight all subgroups equally regardless of their size. Also, in addition to these inequality measures, other fundamental equity metrics are social welfare measures. So while inequality indices kind of only measure equity or inequality impacts, the social welfare indices include an inequality aversion parameter, which represents the decision maker's degree of concern for, for reducing inequality. So for example, the Atkinson index or the column index are such social welfare measures which measure the impact of an intervention depending on different values for an inequality aversion parameter. So with these parameters, with these measures, we directly include some aversion to inequality from um, the decision makers compared to the inequality measures that are more like um, that don't take into account that measure of aversion parameter. And finally, it's also important to keep in mind that different measures can yield different conclusions about the direction of equity impact, which is why comparing results using several indices and several measures is highly recommended too. So now, sim similarly to the cost effectiveness plane in conventional CEA, a simple and convenient way to represent the DCA framework is this equity efficiency impact plan. So again, the origin is a baseline situation without any intervention, but here vertical axis represents the net benefit, either net monetary benefit or net health benefit, telling us how efficient the intervention is at a specific cost effectiveness threshold. And the horizontal axis represents the equity impact, telling us whether the intervention is improving or harming equity. And by improving equity in DCA, we usually mean re reducing inequalities and health-related consequences. So this is exactly where we use the inequality measures that I just presented on the previous slide. And so in that framework, moving to the right on this horizontal axis means improving equity by reducing health inequalities. So again, an intervention here, um, an, in an intervention an intervention strategy that falls in a northeast win-win quadrant in green improves, improves both total health and health equity. And one that falls in a southwest lose-lose quadrant in red harms both. So in these two cases, the efficiency and equity impacts are in the same direction. So there's no need to consider trade-offs in these two cases. By contrast, impacts on total health and equity on the other two quadrants are conflicting and trade-offs is required, are required for these two cases. So in the Northwest lose win-lose quadrants, the option improves health efficiently but harms equity. While in the Southeast lose-win quadrants, the option is less efficient at improving total population health because we go down, but also improves equity because we go on the right side on the horizontal axis. So in the south, in this last example, for example, in, in the southeast quadrant, 
The challenge and decision problem would be how to reduce health inequality or improve health equity, which is the same thing in this framework, without sacrificing too much efficiency in improving health outcomes overall. So now that we've, see, that we've seen the main concepts and the overall framework for DCA, the question is, how do we conduct a distributional cost effectiveness analysis? And what are the main steps to this? So there are several building blocks that represent the main components of conducting a DCA. So first and foremost, we need to determine the study design. And by study design, I mean that we have to define the relevant consequences and related outcomes. For example, the question is, is the concern about equity in the health outcomes or is the concern about equity in providing equal access to services? Or maybe the concern is about equity in financial protection because falling ill can put people at risk of serious financial hardship due to large and unexpected out-of-pocket medical costs. So we have to define these related outcomes and consequences. And still, in this study design step, we also have to define the equity relevant variables that define population subgroups, as I mentioned previously. So in this case, of course, the decision maker or the idea that we have of the decision maker should have underlying equity concerns and objectives for reducing inequalities among these subgroups. And this actually orientates um, the choice of the study design. Now, once that we've defined the consequences of concern and the equity relevant variables, we can start simulating the distribution of the outcome. So first, we need to simulate the distribution, the baseline distribution of cost and benefits according to these equity relevant variables, meaning the distribution prior to any new intervention, that is the current baseline situation. And then, after taking into account the potential intervention strategies, we need to simulate what the new distribution of benefits and cost will be post decision. And only then we can examine this final distribution and compare it to the baseline distribution. So the idea here is to estimate who's likely to gain and to lose from these new interventions and by how much. So in the previous slide, I mentioned the notions of baseline and final distributions. And the thing is that defining a proper baseline distribution is essential because it will affect both absolute or related differences between baseline and final distribution. So here on this slide is a hypothetical example to illustrate this point. So as you can see, there are two different scenarios, scenario one and scenario two for baseline distributions of the health outcome, which is here the um, life expectancy. And just keep in mind that these are two different scenarios, so or baseline situations, if you prefer. So it is not two different strategies or interventions. And this is presented on this slide for two equity relevant population subgroups that we call group A and group B. And as you can see, group A has a lower life expectancy than group B in both scenarios. But the absolute difference or the absolute inequality is higher in scenario one with initial life expectancies of 40 and 75 years, which yields a 35 years absolute difference compared to scenario two with initial life expectancies of 70 and 80 years, yielding a 10 years absolute difference. And the relative, the relative the relative differences are also greater in scenario one with 88 person difference than in scenario two with a 14 person difference. Now, imagine that we have a new intervention increasing life expectancy by seven years for group A and by six years for group B. And this regardless of the scenario. So this happens in both scenarios. So this is represented here on this slide with the red bars. And as you can see, the absolute change the absolute change in health inequality is exactly the same in both scenarios. Indeed, the inequality in life expectancy is reduced by one year uh, in both scenarios. So from 30 year, 35 years to 34 years in scenario one, and from 10 years to nine years in scenario two. 
But the thing is that the relative change in health inequality is greater in scenario one because we pass from 88% to 72%, which is a reduction of 16 percentage points compared to scenario two, where we pass from 14% to 12%, which is here a reduction of only two percentage points. So in other words, the intervention delivers a proportionately larger benefit to people with lower pre-existing levels of life expectancy in scenario one compared to scenario two. So we just wanted to show that example to highlight the importance of defining a proper baseline distribution representing the baseline level of inequality because this choice ultimately influences the assessment of the equity impact. And it also illustrates that it is generally a sensible idea to present both relative and absolute measures of inequality, because as you can see here, it seems to be like way different results depending on if we present it as absolute difference or relative difference. Then once the distributions have been simulated. They can be evaluated and ranked in terms of efficiency, of equity, and of overall assessment of social welfare by taking into account both, both efficiency and equity. And whenever possible, of course, the evaluation should be based on the objectives chosen by the decision maker. So this evaluation can be done informally by visualizing and tabulating the results in a dashboard or distributional breakdowns in a way that I just showed in a previous slide. Then the decision makers can just make their own assessment of equity impact according to their value judgments based on the pre and post policy distributions of cost and benefits. But alternatively, we can also use one of the four formal approaches listed on this slide in order to more quantitatively and comprehensively evaluate the trade-offs between efficiency and equity objectives. But these methods are not exclusive, so they can totally be used all together. So first, we can perform some dominance tests, to check whether one distribution is unequivocally better than another, and this for all groups under almost all definition of equity and efficiency. Then, if trade-offs exist between efficiency and equity, Equity weighting methods can also be useful. So there are two main approaches for equity weighting, which are pretty similar actually. So there is the direct equity weights, uh, which give priority directly to specific groups. And we also have the indirect equity weights that give priority to specific groups, but as a function of their health outcomes with for example, greater weight assigned to people who are worse off in terms of their health. And finally, we can turn to some specific inequality indices, such as the ones mentioned earlier, that can be so complex or simple, ordered or non-ordered, absolute or relative, and weighted or unweighted. And these indices can be used along with efficiency measures such as monetary, net monetary benefit or net health benefits to determine whether there are trade-offs between equity and efficiency. So for example, if the outcomes of one intervention strategy are more equal than another one, according to an inequality index, meaning that it improves equity and that it is not less efficient, then it is a dominant strategy. And as discussed previously, different indices can yield different results, which is why comparing results using several indices is totally recommended. So finally, I wanted to acknowledge that the main source for this module on DCA is the handbook edited by Cookson and colleagues. So for anyone who wants to go further on this subject, we recommend this book, which is detailed and provides several practical examples.